Did you get permission to say hi? Uh, yeah, kind of. Only English. <laughs> Ah, nice to see your grinning face. Well, um, I'm always grinning. <laughs> I just saw English. Mm. It says good. Yeah, the English dude, the road. English Are you guy. In car? The great videos about Vox Commando. This guy is rock. <laughs> I'm literally about to go into the restaurant, so uh, I thought okay. I'd say hello and then disappear. That's okay. Can you show us what it looks like out the window? Yeah, kind of. I'm in the middle of Nottingham. Uh, that's oh, Nisha. Yeah, well, that's the wrong way. Hi, Nisha. Hello. Uh, it's an ugly, ugly parking area, actually. i got to go. Enjoy, guys. Taste of Britain. Thanks for <laughs> yeah. dropping in. We will. Take it easy. Ciao. It's probably a good idea that I talk about it. Um, there's a few things that uh, probably need to be set straight in terms of people's expectations of what it's going to be. Um, I'm not working on version 1 anymore, so anything new that I do is going to be in version 2 only. So in that sense, once I get it out the door and sort of get the major problems solved, it's going to be a good opportunity for me to start innovating again and adding new features because I've been kind of stuck doing the transition from one version to the next. But obviously the main difference with version 2 is that we now have two different engines that you can choose from for speech recognition. And the, the new engine that we're adding is not necessarily any better than the old one. In fact, for some people, the old engine is still going to be a much better choice. So uh, I don't want people to think, oh, it's got a new engine, it's going to understand me better, it's good. so it's going to be, uh, I'm definitely going to want to use the new engine because it's new. The new engine is, uh, is an, an extra option that people are going to have and it's going to allow a, a lot of people that don't speak English to have access to uh, an engine that works in their own language. So there are, I don't know how many uh, engines available right now from Microsoft, but it's something like 20 or 30 different languages. There's, and for English, there is, for example, an Australian one, an Indian one, um, and then there's lots of other languages, I think, like Russian and Italian and, and even a, a Portuguese Brazil yes. engine as well. So in that sense, it's really good. In my tests with um, a headset or with the Amulet remote and speaking in English, I still get better results with the old engine than I do with the new engine. So uh, the new engine is designed also to work with uh, without any training, which is an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage because it's probably going to work better for your friends instead of being trained specifically for your voice, or it's going to work better in a family environment with a variety of people that are all speaking more or less the same type of English. Um, but on the other hand, because there is no training, it's overall going to be less accurate, and especially uh, they, they don't allow you to do dictation at all. So you won't be able to use it to do a Google search. Um, you'll, you'll only be able to use phrases that are predefined. So you can still do all of your music, your payload XMLs, your lists, your ranges and everything, but you won't be able to just speak uh, and get a, a, a string to do a, a web search or something like that. You won't be able to say search YouTube for X-Men or whatever unless X-Men is part of a list of, of um, in your payload XML. So that's the, the first thing. Um, a lot of the work I've been doing also is just moving some core features into plugins. So I had um, MediaMonkey wasn't was not a plugin; it was part of the main 
-hmm. Vox Commando executable. So I'm trying to move everything out into a plugin. Windows Media Center is being moved into a plugin. Um, the TTS is being moved into a plugin. And I'm going to try, uh, I've, I've made the TTS a little bit um, nicer looking and easier to set up. And uh, I'm also planning later on to make some enhancements with text-to-speech where you can um, output from text-to-speech either to an Arduino or to output um, a, a, as the text-to-speech is speaking, it's going to output pho a phoneme. So it'll be an event for every type of sound like a, e, o, or a, m, or a, p. It's going to send out um, an event that you could use either to make a talking head or if you wanted to have uh, flashing lights, different different colors for different words, that sort of thing is going to be an option. So if you have one of those uh, L color LED screens or or something that can react quickly, it will be able to kind of create more of an artificial intelligence look. So that's one of the ideas that I have for text-to-speech. And um, also I have an alternate text-to-speech plugin that you can use for people that can't afford to buy and who don't want to download illegal software, which many people do for the text-to-speech engines. Um, Microsoft now has a lot of free text-to-speech engines in a lot of different languages. So the second plugin allows you to use those. They're not the best voices, but they're at least as good as Anna. And they come in, again, I think 20 different languages or something like that. Cool. So um, the other thing that that we should expect with version two is that when I release it tomorrow or the day after, there's going to be stuff in it that's broken. There's going to be stuff that you need to um, change in your, if you want to use your old configuration, you'll probably have to go and make some adjustments. If, for example, if you were using Media Monkey, you'll need to make sure and go and turn that plugin on now. Um, but I don't think it'll be too bad. So far with our tests, I've got everything working in my main configuration on my HTPC uh, without any problems that I know of. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of, and, and, and things that are working now, um, the, the point of version two is I want to kind of free myself to make mistakes and to innovate new stuff. So even if it isn't broken now, in the coming months I may do some things that uh, obviously I'll, I'll make an effort to not break things so that people can continue to work with their current configurations. But I want to be free to, to make some changes. Maybe a, a few things will lose backwards compatibility, but hopefully the end product is going to be um, more powerful and more flexible. And uh, it's going to be over the course of the next six months probably that version two is really going to come to become more of a finished product. And then it'll still continue to grow, obviously. And then maybe we'll we'll start thinking about version three. Great. Mm -hmm. So this. Um, the one that we're using now is the one that comes with uh, Windows Vista and later. But since Vista, it's basically the the same basic machine. And it's uh, what I call the desktop engine because it's the same engine that's used by the operating system. So if you actually want to turn on speech recognition and, and uh, use their built-in commands, you're using that desktop speech engine. And if you want to if you want to do dictation in Word or something like that using the Microsoft engine, you're using that built-in engine. And that means that some operating systems like Windows Server don't have it built in. And so you can't use it at all. The other one is, yes, it's still Microsoft's speech engine. It's called uh, the speech platform. I'll, I can send you a link actually. Let me see what I've got here on my uh, I have a page on the wiki which I'll, I'll post into the chat box here in a second.
Testing, testing, one, two, three. I am Ren. I can hear you. Hi, James. Okay, just testing. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to paste a link here. These are your basic setup instructions. So you need to install a minimum of two things to use Vox Commando version, well, not to use version 2, but to use the alternate engine in version 2. You need to first install the speech platform runtime. And Vox Commando, I've been continuing to build Vox Commando for 32-bit only because a lot of people have 32-bit text-to-speech voices that don't work in 64-bit. That's the reason that I've, uh, even though it's been a pain in the ass actually, I've been always making sure that my builds are made for the x86 version. So that may change in the future, but for now I'm sticking with 32-bit uh, version. And I don't think it makes any difference to performance, honestly, whether you use a 32-bit or a 62-bit. Um, so you need to install the runtime, and then you need to download and install at least one of the languages for the runtime. So if you follow the links on that wiki page, um, you'll see the list of all the languages that you can install. And they have um, all of their speech recognition engines and all of their text-to-speech voices are all on the same page. They have the, the uh, at the top of the page, after you click download, the first uh, half of the page is all of their speech recognition engines, and then down at the bottom half, they have all of their text-to-speech engines that you can install. And the other, the other big difference is that if you have if you do have Bluetooth, um, again, it, it doesn't work as well with a good quality microphone. Uh, there's a few funny things, but if you do want to use it with Bluetooth, um, the old version of Vox Commando is basically useless with Bluetooth. The new with the new uh, speech engine, it does work reasonably well with even just a cheapo $30 Bluetooth headset like this one that I have, which is a Motorola. Uh, so obviously they're not all the same. Some will work better than others. But uh, you can get reasonably good results with a cheapo one. Everyone has a different opinion, and one thing I found is that you'll almost never pick a voice that's from your part of the world. So uh, Kala, who is German, thinks that the American voices sound more realistic. I find, in English, I find that the British voices sound more realistic. I don't know if that's because they're actually better or if it's because because I, I'm better at picking out mistakes in an accent that I'm used to. But I, I like VW Bridget the best. I find that she sounds the most human, but also easy to understand. And I like Ivona, the one that uh, Hibbert uses, uh, Ivona um, Brian, which is the guy who sounds a bit like a butler. Um, He's easy to understand and and he's funny, <laughs> but he also he has they all have problems still for sure. He he talks particularly slow. He has weird long pauses between words for no apparent reason, but it makes it overall pretty easy to understand. Um, in the in terms of the free voices, there is like there's a f um, let me just check here. It's going to launch version two. There's a voice called Hazel. I don't know if you can hear it. I don't know if it's possible for me to, to send my system sound or only my microphone sound. It is possible, James. You've got to do a stereo mix. Yeah, I'm afraid of breaking anything, though, at this point. 
Um, anyway, let me try putting my headset next to the speaker instead. Hello, I am Helen. Pleased to meet you. So I'm not going to share my, um, my, my screen as well so you can see what I'm doing instead of seeing my ugly face. <laughs> Uh, okay. Okay. Hopefully, you can see my screen here. So this is Hazel. This is so. This is the free one of the free Microsoft Voices. Cheers, Governor. My name is Hazel. Do you fancy some chit chat? Hello. My name is Armani. Ciao, amico. Il mio nome è Lucia. Ciao, mio estas. <laughs> So those are the Microsoft voices, and so this is this is the new uh, TTS plugin screen here, and these are the two that I like of the paid voices. Um, oh, I don't have Brian installed. This is Paul. He's American. Hello, my name is Paul, and this is the the British woman that I like. Hello. I am Bridget. Pleased to meet you. Definitely the best. Yeah, so I use Bridget quite a lot. And usually if I'm doing a video, I use Bridget or I use Brian. I don't have Brian installed on this machine right now. Uh, so the other thing is that now you'll be able to set a default. In the plugin settings, you'll be able to set a default output and a volume. So it's not a not a huge leap forward, but it's a little bit nicer interface, and you can see if they're boys or girls. As you can see, as you can see, the interface looks more or less the same. This is version. I'm calling it version 1.9, and working my way up to as I get closer to what I think will be a stable or complete version two. Well, then we'll be at 2.0 rather than releasing things called release candidate one, release candidate two. I like to kind of set a, set a goal of reaching 2.0. Um, so the, the Gen XML, we, we used to have a window for Gen XML that's gone now because everything's been moved into a plugin. So MediaMonkey now has its own. Oops. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Accidentally Gen XML when I wanted to go into plugin settings. Um, if you click on Gen XML, yeah, it'll it'll open Media Monkey. Um, so this is plugin settings for Media Monkey, which is pretty much all about Gen XML. Um, oh, and, and XBMC Eden now is being completely removed. Um, in XJSON now we have I've moved the settings into the plugin for for your o OSD notification or your alternates notification. Um, but other than that, no major changes here. Maybe as we get closer to version 2.0, we'll do we'll make some cosmetic changes. I'm not sure. I prefer to work on the the form. Uh, sorry, on the function instead of the form at this point. So uh, if people are hoping that it's going to be all sexy and black, it's not. It's not it's going to be the same looking program, but hopefully uh, more flexible. Um, what else? Yeah, in terms of the actual folder, uh, I've added a little thing. You can double click on the uh, bottom left part where it shows you the path of uh, the, the current Vox Commando that you're running, because I don't know about you, but I have about 10 different folders with different configurations in them. So you can just double click here to open up the folder. It's the same as going to the file menu and going to browse VC folder. And I just wanted to show you that we have two different executables now. One is uh, the Vox Commando.exe is the traditional speech engine, and Vox Commando SP will be the uh, the new alternate speech platform uh, engine. And when you go into options, 
depending on which version you're running, you'll be able to choose. Here you can choose. Um, I, you can see this little banner down here shows which one I'm running. I'm running on the, the speech platform, which is the alternate. <coughs> and you can choose from uh, whichever engines you've installed from that web page that I linked to. And there's a speech profile for Connect as well. I don't know uh, whether it makes a huge difference, but you know they have um, English Canadian and English US engine, and then they have an English Canadian and a U English US engine specifically for Connect. So if you're using a Connect, you may get better results doing that. But if you're using something like Bluetooth or a regular microphone, I've, I don't think you want to use the Connect one. I've tried it and it doesn't work at all. So. Um, so here they've got like an Italian engine that I've installed just to test it because we didn't have Italian before. And I put in a little a little link here actually that opens up this window where you can download more Microsoft voices. So if you go in here, you can see all of these engines that you can choose from. So here's your PTBR, Portuguese, Portuguese, Russian, Russian. There's gonna there's some Danish, some some Dutch, all sorts of stuff in there. So in our tests, a lot of it works really well, but some stuff doesn't work so well. Um, for example, we were, we just discovered yesterday that when you say set volume 45, for some reason the confidence on that command comes comes out really low. It actually it recognizes you properly, but you have to go and change the required confidence for that command to a lower number because it's some weird thing in that particular engine. I don't know uh, if it's only in the English engine. But, so there will be some uh, adjustments that need to be made, and I guess you know there's going to be a new learning curve for people. But uh, hopefully it'll be worth it. James, uh, are we going to have a, a better VC pause in version two? Um, I don't know if you're using it, but the current version, if you put plus plus in the name and you use pause, works fine. It, does, it creates uh, it runs the command in its own thread during the pauses. The rest of the time it has to be running on the, the main thread anyway because it, there's so much interaction with the UI elements of the program, with that, with that speech engine, with the history window, all, all of these things need to be running on the same thread. So um, I suppose I, I could make it, a, a, instead of having to change the name to plus plus, I could put it in uh, as a checkbox that you put somewhere, but um, other than that, I don't see any major changes in terms of um, uh, how the, the commands will run. I'm afraid if you just go start running all of your commands in their own thread that there's going to be things happening out of order and unpredictable behavior. So I don't, Imran, does that address your question or is there something in particular that you think we could do? Yeah, it does address my question. So basically, it's going to be the same, isn't it, then? Yeah. Well, what would you like to see? You want to see it a command act like a plus plus command by default? Or you then, want to see it... You know, instead of doing plus plus, wouldn't it be easier just to have a, a separate command for it? A separate you know, like command? VC, VC pause special or VC special pause. Uh, it's because the actual command itself needs to be defined as a, it's not an action that's going to turn it into its own thread. It's the actual command. When we launch the command, it needs to know, okay, I'm running in my own thread. Okay. No so, problem. I can still live with it. But but have you been using plus plus? Because it generally, I find it works well. I just didn't want to make it too easy for people that they would start using it unnecessarily and and possibly causing problems that were then going to be hard for us to diagnose when we're trying, when people come on the forum and they say this command doesn't work, but they don't mention the fact that they're running it in its own thread and it leads to confusion. That's the the, the reason that I didn't make it part of the UI because I don't want people that don't really know what they're doing to be just going and clicking that box and causing problems. Right. Well, I've not used the plus plus me. I've I've just taken the Python path. Yeah, well, you, you should. Pause it, in Python. Yeah, 
The other thing, nice thing about the plus plus is that it's, you immediately see in your tree any command that has a plus plus in front of it is 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 a command that's got some kind of uh, uh, it indicates to you that it's running its own thread and that it's probably a command that's going to take time to execute. You should try it. I mean, uh, depending on what you want to do, often Python is a better route. But if you just want to make something wait for five seconds in the middle of execution, it's actually a pretty good choice. You could try it out. So I definitely will. Yeah, just think of it like C++. You just put the plus plus in there at the beginning of the command name in your tree. And then uh, any long pauses, it'll kind of step out into its own thread while it's waiting. And then when the pause is finished, it, it reinserts itself back into the main thread. Got you. Yeah, multi-threading is a, is a potentially disastrous uh, thing at, at all times and, and not to be undertaken lightly, <laughs> especially, yeah. especially yeah. by an amateur program. Sorry? So the whole reason I created this was for Imran originally, um, and sometimes you'll want... Vox Commando to do a step and then let's say you want to, um, uh, in my case I have a, a network receiver, stereo receiver, but um, I need to use infrared to turn it on. And then it takes about 10 seconds before it's capable of receiving um, network commands because it basically has to boot up. So if I wanted to make a command that waited 10 seconds, I could use VC pause and I could put in 10,000, uh, 10, but that, that's because everything's running on the same thread, that means that Vox Commando is basically going to be frozen during that time. So by creating a separate thread, the, the program can continue to run while this command is sort of waiting in the wings in its own thread. But because almost all of the actions do things that interact with the rest of the program, they need to be to, to run back in the original thread. So what it does is it steps out, it hangs out in its own thread, and then it steps back in, or back onto the main thread where where everything is happening with the history window and the log and all that stuff. But that's the reason is if, if you want to wait for um, a quarter of a second for a page to open so that you can type in your password or something, it's not really a big deal. But if you want to wait for three, four seconds, then you may want to think about putting plus plus in there. Because everything's waiting for that for that command to finish. Another thing that you can do, though, if you if you are waiting for a long time, is to do a timed event uh, where you trigger an event over um, based on a timer. Can also work really well. So, are you guys still seeing my screen here? Yep. So you could do one action, which is whatever, um, you know, some kind of turn your TV on action. That's not real. And then you would do VC. Um, set event timer. So, if I and the and the um, event timer can have payloads as well, so you can you can do quite a lot with it. Looks like I have a bit of a UI issue here on this. It's weird.
So the first parameter is how long to wait, and then the name of the event to fire, and then you can pass in payloads as well. So if you wanted to say uh, turn on the TV and go to channel 12, you could you could create an event that would that would be triggered in 30 seconds, and the payload could be the channel that you wanted to switch to once the t once the TV was ready. PC, uh, it's unable to do so because uh, something to do with your program. It's something to do with the on-screen display. Yeah, that's um, as far, I don't know the solution to that. As far as I can tell, that's a bug in Windows. Okay. Because Windows is claiming that the program won't close, but if you go to close it manually, it always it closes without any issue. Oh, so sorry. I don't understand. And I've had it happen with other programs other than Vox Commander as well, and it. Um, it seems to be more likely to happen the longer Vox Commando is running. So, the one solution that I—it's when you want to shut down the the computer. That's right. Um, are you using the latest version? No, I'm still using Windows Seven. No, are you using no, the latest I mean, uh, version of Vox Commando? Yes, I am. The latest version you gave me. Okay, because I thought I had, I, well, I had tried in, in there, in this, if you use Vox Commando to initiate the sleep, that it tries to shut itself down first. Are you using Vox Commando to sleep or something else? I'm not using to, something else. Not to sleep, sorry, but to shut down. Yeah, I'm using something else. If you use, uh, what, and what are you using? I'm using an app. Hmm. And I don't think there's any solution, but if you're using Vox Commando, the built-in shutdown command in Vox Commando, then I think there's a better chance that it'll close itself first. Yeah, and the weird thing is it doesn't happen all the time. It's, no. it's a rare event. Yeah, I know. I've seen it before, and like I said, I've seen it with other programs as well. And those programs also are are perfectly willing to shut down if you ask them to. So it's it's definitely a problem with Windows. Um, I realized that there's probably something happening in Vox Commando that I could change, but I don't know what it is. Right. Are you using Windows 8? No. I have a Windows 8 machine set up just for testing basic stuff, but I don't like Windows 8 at all, so I'm using Windows 7. Got you. Same here. I, I loathe it. <laughs> uh, I know eventually, uh, there are some things about it that I like, okay. Um, there's a few little things that I find interesting, like when you're copying files, some little UI changes that they made that are good, but everything else I find sucks because it's basically designed for tablets and I'm not using a tablet. So let's not get into that. Yes. Yeah. Well, if it's a web page, I just want to take a second to go back to Imran's question because I thought of something. Just about the OSD, Imran, that fact that it's mentioning that is just because we create child windows for the commands and the alternates, and I leave those windows open and hidden because otherwise, whenever you want to do an OSD message, when you create a new window, it's hard to do it in a way that doesn't steal focus away from the program that you're on. So, yes. but if you leave it open and hide it and then unhide it, it doesn't mess with your focus. So that's, those windows are always open all the time uh, mm -hmm. after Vox Comeno has started. And so when you try to close, it's just seeing those there, but they're not, as far as I know, they shouldn't be causing any problems. They're just child windows that have been left open. Yeah. 
Um, and when when uh, Windows tries to shut it down, it decides, oh, there's these are the things that are open, and they're I guess they're considered on top of the main window, so it it lists them as being the problem. But I don't think they actually are the problem. Well, I got you. Okay. Okay. So going back to the scrape, uh, for what you want to do, I'm not familiar with Google Now or how it works on the desktop. I haven't played with it at all. But it's an interactive UI thing. So if you wanted to interact with that using Vox Commando, you'd probably need to use uh, Robo Browser because Robo Browser actually creates a browser as opposed to the scrape function, which just sends an URL and takes back text. So Google now is using all sorts of CSS and JavaScript and all sorts of stuff that the scrape command is going to completely ignore. The scrape command just downloads text. It's really great if you want to go and get information and cut it up into pieces that you can pull out. Like if you wanted to go to IMDB and grab information about a movie or if you wanted to do um, uh, a DuckDuckGo search and grab information about the top hits or if you wanted to go check a forum or an RSS feed and just get back text and analyze it and turn it into a text-to-speech or on-screen message, Scrape is really great for that. Or if you just want to feed an URL into a device like uh, uh, Vera, for example, basically the Vera plugin is using a variation of Scrape where it's sending information on using the URL of a web page. Um, and so, and same thing with um, with the XBMC plugin. This is all being done through an HTTP interface using something similar to Scrape, where you're sending uh, either using GET or POST, but you're sending information through this web server. Um, sometimes Scrape won't work at all because the page, the initial page that you get from the web server is just text that then runs scripts and those scripts go and do other things. So um, the initial HTML that you get from the page might not actually have much in it, but then it, has a, it runs a JavaScript that goes and downloads something else. And so in a situation like that, you can't use Scrape. You have to use uh, RoboBrowser because RoboBrowser actually creates a browser in a form and it responds to all of that JavaScript like a normal web browser would. So I don't, I don't know if I want to get into doing a tutorial on RoboBrowser right now because it's a bit complicated. Yeah, and the RoboBrowser is something that actually has a ton of potential. And um, there's room for a lot more development to make it more user-friendly and more powerful. One thing, though, is that it is based on Internet Explorer, and I think it's based on whichever version of Internet, Ex Internet Explorer you have installed in your system. Um, so if you've got Internet Explorer 9, your robo browser is running Internet Explorer 9. Um, and it just if you want to look into it more, there are some tutorials on the YouTube page, and we do one on our groceries, which covers a little bit. There's some XML on the forum as well that goes with that tutorial. So that would get you kind of, uh, it would be a good starting point to get an idea of what Robo Browser is about. I would say um, it depends on what your needs are, but if the USB UIRT meets your needs ergonomically, then it's the better choice because it costs less, it's easier to use, and it does more you can use it both for receiving infrared, so you can use it with Event Ghost or, or directly with Vox Commando to use any kind of infrared remote to trigger an event. 
Um, so if you have an old remote lying around that you're not using anymore from an old DVD player or something, you can use that as an input device now to control other things like your lights or whatever. Um, the only thing is that it's got to be USB t connected to your computer. Um, the the iTac is harder harder to use, but it but you can plug it in anywhere in your house that you've got an Ethernet connection, or you can get the Wi-Fi version. You're paying about twice as much as you would for the USB UIRT um, in in order to have that freedom, but you also can't use it as an input device. And for learning codes, I found it's a bit easier with the USB UIRT. So, um, I have not actually been actively using the, the USB UART in my everyday life, but when I was developing with it, excuse me, and, and doing tests and whatnot, I think I only ran into problems when I was trying to learn codes and both programs were using it. But when you're just, if you're just using it as an input device, I don't think there's a conflict with both of them using it at the same time. So uh, especially if you're just using from Vox Commando, if you're only using it to send infrared using maps or whatever, I don't think there's a conflict, but I, I haven't stress tested it, so I can't give you a definitive answer on it. I would definitely say that it's worth giving it a shot. If you've already got one, don't be afraid to try it because it may just work fine. I definitely, if you're using it for learning, you may want to um, disable one program when you're, and, and then use the other one for learning. I don't know if that's if you were doing trying to learn codes when you were having problems, or if it was just when you were trying to use a remote to trigger events. Mm. Yeah. Well, if you could buy a, a HALX, that would be <laughs> perfect for that sort of thing. But unfortunately, uh, those aren't for sale at the moment. What's happening in that world, Imran? Yo, uh, what it is, James, I've taken a break, yeah, because, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, I've been at you for many years, yeah, and my back and my arm are fucked up because of that. So I've decided to take a break for a good few months. Yeah, okay. And I, don't well, know, I, I understand that. I just don't know what to do, man. I mean, the thing is, I do want to go ahead and build these devices, but there are certain aspects of it that I'm not really happy with, mm. especially the RF transmitter side. So I don't know. I don't know whether I should, because I mean, like I said to you, yeah, you know, I actually made this gadget first and foremost for myself. Yeah. And then, I mean, you got hold of one, yeah. And Carly and whatnot, and I mean you've, I mean you've not sent me an email saying that look there's something gone wrong with it. So I've I've been presuming that it's been working okay for you. Is that true? Mine has been working fine for me. Yeah, I know that uh, Carla's um, brother had problems with his with yeah. uh, with RF uh, transmission problems in terms of the range being very limited. Precisely, and the thing is, yeah, I've got these other RF transmitters. I, you're, in fact, the RF transceivers, so they're built-in RF receiver and transmitter, and and they work on multiple frequencies as well. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, they are much harder to program, yeah, you know, than these other ones. These other ones are very, very simple. I just have to send the data to the module, and it just does everything. Whereas this other transceiver is much more complicated so I've got to right. spend some time with it yeah maybe a month or so yeah to get to grips with it 
But if I well, do it, if you make yeah, any progress, you know, you know who to t to uh, inform first. <laughs> oh yeah, it's going to be definitely you. Yeah, I'm going to inform you definitely. Yeah, and the thing is, as soon as I get a bit of time, yeah, I'm hoping to implement this new RF transceiver because mm -hmm. I think this this is the way forward. Especially if you, can, if you can choose different ones, frequencies, yeah. that would be great. Precisely, you can choose different frequencies and you can tune it as well. Yeah, so I yeah. mean, if there's a RF de RF device that I mean isn't made perfectly, so I'm hoping that with this transceiver I can tune it. Yeah, you know, so that it does work with these other gadgets that are off tune. Yeah. Well, yeah, but like I said, it's a big experiment. Yeah, and I'm hoping to do it this year. Okay, well, um, good if luck, it does good work, luck. Anyway. Um, this is the device that I do want to sell, and if it does, I mean, and the thing is, before I actually sell anything, yeah, you know, I want to make sure that it actually works 100%, and I'm not, yeah. I, yeah. and I'm not going to have any complaints. Yeah, it's hard to do when you're just one person. Precisely. Yeah. So I have the thing similar, is, uh, similar challenges. Wait. Yeah, unfortunately, Sean, you will have to wait a little while. Yeah, I just don't know. Yeah, I'm a busy guy doing all kinds of stuff. It depends how how hands up hands on you are. Also, there's a lot that you can do with uh, Arduino. Uh, for one example, and there's a lot of different IR transmitter devices that are out there that just do just do IR. But I think that the uh, the ITAC, uh, the Wi-Fi ITAC, which I don't know if you can get them secondhand, but you can get them new for about a hundred bucks. Uh, they're not a bad choice if you want to be able to control stuff in different parts of your house. Yeah, but they're still limited uh, because I've got one, uh, James, yeah, yeah. Uh, these Wi-Fi ITACs. So the thing is, I mean, the thing is, it may fulfill other people's needs, but it does not fulfill my needs. No, no, I'm talking to Sean. He was, I mean, so, we were talking specifically about it, controlling infrared stuff. That's all they do so, is infrared, so that's obviously a limitation. Hmm. Um, yeah. 